Hello, everyone. Welcome to the W3C community group hangout for Open Active, January 2023, 18th of January 2023. And um, it could be a short session today because we're, we're quite light on numbers. Uh, reminder if you haven't already, please join the W3C community group. There's a link in the slides which are up on the W3C pages. Uh, so, a quick update today on where we are with the data quality reporting. And I'll talk about some um, a timeline for the updates to the supporting tools. Um, just had a bing bong, was that? Nick joining. Hi, Nick. Um, quick outline of uh, some a proposed timeline for updates to the tools throughout this year. And at the end, a discussion call for topics for this group to focus on. Um, so that's the, the plan to cover today. And, oh, there we go. So uh, in terms of data quality, we shared just before Christmas a document, I think we posted links on the W3C group and via email to, to some. Um, Chris, maybe you could stick that link in the chat if, uh, if you've got it handy. Brilliant. Yep, it's in the chat now. Thank you. Um, so here we just spell out the process that we've been through over the course of um, what, probably five or six calls, um, pointing towards the Office of National Statistics Data, Act, data Quality Action Planning Approach, um, where you consider what the use case is, what the need for the data is, consider which elements are important, work out what things, what good would look like for those elements, and then put in place some means to report them on a regular basis to kind of drive um, positive data improvement. So we're at that stage where we drafted out some measures. I'm just scrolling down to this page here. An example data quality dashboard. This is kind of aggregated figures for the whole, for a snapshot of the, um, the data mid-November. Um, and these are some of the, the elements that we identified as important. So an activity that matches to the activity list, that it has a name or a description, um, postcodes, some kind of geographic element that uh, they are relevant for discovery. So these are we're looking for events that are coming up. Um, this is a the URL there is a clue that it's a bookable event, and we know that not all of them are. Um, so these are very general figures. So what I've done now is started uh, working out what this would look like at a feed level. So we have a, a couple of examples and I'll share this link at the moment. So this, I think I try to work through one of the, one from each of the, the catalogs. So we've got a, um, a Gladstone catalog legend, um, book tech and the kind of other catalog. Um, so, but it's not automated at this stage. So it's a little bit fiddly. So that's one of our next steps is to start reporting this. So, but here's some figures for, um, for what the, one chosen at random, um, and it's this one here, which is Leisure SK. And so there's some some positive things there. So these are all relevant records; they're all up, up to date in the future. Some of them are some of the feeds have quite old old data. Um, everything has a name or a description. Where I couldn't find um activity labels that match the activity list or activity IDs. Um, valid postcodes, all good stuff. Um, most of them had an indication of the cost or that it was free. Uh, and there were no restrictions indicated. Um, so just a quick example, uh, there's one more which was from the second uh, set of catalogs. Um, smaller number of events. Again, I couldn't find an activity list of matches. Um, not everything had a, a description. They all had a, a, um, a name, but included some with the, the name reference class do not book. So I was unsure whether that was a, a good, a positive result or not. Um, and here, everything had postcodes, but these were old events, they weren't up to date, they weren't, um, you know, they'll be filtered out by most activity finders. 
because they haven't in the past. And they clearly indicated no restrictions um, for gender or I think for gender that one. So just a quick example of, of what it looks like at a, an individual feed level. Um, and apologies to the to the two organizations that I've kind of highlighted there, but um, the plan is to automate that process so we can generate these figures um, on a regular basis and, and report them for, for people to, to comment and explore. I'll pause there for a moment if anyone has any any thoughts. Okay. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Wonderful. Uh, there's background noise in the office I'm in, so apologies. I'll stay on mute as much as I can. Um, uh, yeah, I was just going to suggest that this is really great. It might be worth surfacing this to the AEF forum, where there'll be a, a probably because this is it's more of a business requirements thing, kind of which of these are focused on, I guess rather than um, a kind of more technical uh, yeah. how question. Um, yeah. of, so that might, that's just a, a thought, thought I had there. Yeah. Okay, well, on that point, Chris is talking. Um, we've got a slot, I think, this week's AEF to, to share some of this. So um, he's got the, the, the broader document about the report and framework and a couple of examples here. And possibly by then we'll have a few more as well. So to kind of bring it to life for, for those groups. Super. Okay, well, I'll, so this is a work to come and um, we're, we're, we're keen to discuss the results or the process, you know, with, with anyone, any, any data publisher that's interested or, or any data user, of course, to check that we're kind of honing in on the right things in terms of data quality as they see it. So um, I'll move on now, um, but please do get in touch with Chris or myself um, or hello at openactive.io you want to know more about this. So proposed timeline for tool development. Um, this is just a sketched out view of our plan. We have um, a new developer join the team from the ODI. Uh, so we have a little more resource now to start looking at updating some of the tools um, to make it easier for data publishers and for data, data users. So our plan, is to make a start with the crawler, which is the code that goes to the catalog of catalogs and then spiders out to each catalog, to each dataset site, to um, get a list of all the open active endpoints, all the API feeds that are out there. So that is the um, first thing. I'm going to use that to update the status page. The current status page is been populated by a static lists right now so that that there's a chance that will be out of date um so that's the plan so we'll update the crawler update stage page and move on to look at um what can we learn from the visualizer tool that's out there already that already does some of this work the crawling and harvesting feeds so we'll look to extend that and create a data quality reporting or uh, explorer tool. Uh, and again, we'll feed the results of that into the states page. So we'll start to fill out um, this view of what's happening with the open active data with some more, with some of the insight that we're getting from the data quality reporting work. Then we'll move on um, as our developer gets more familiar with the data and the, uh, and the feeds, we'll move on to the validators and then explore the booking capabilities in the test suite. And we'll make, again, then we'll return to the status page. So we are showing the results of validation and the test suite right there on the status page. So this is kind of one-stop shop, shows you everything uh, you need to know about a feed. Um, and that's, those, these are approximate timelines that, you know, just to flag that now. Um, 
yeah, so because currently the there's just a very simple test. This flag here, green tick or red cross, is a very simple check to see that you're getting some kind of response from the API feed. And we want that to be a little bit more informative and um, a little bit more useful. So it will show whether the API is live and up and running, whether it's returning, you know, passes the validator, all those kind of things. Um, so I'll pause again there. Any any questions at that stage? Uh, one thing on the uh, just a question on whether we are also going to do some work on the reference implementation. Uh, that's the kind of bit that works alongside uh, any changes to the test suite and validator. I guess would need to be reflected in the reference implementation uh, so that everything can still yeah. work. Um, so it might be worth. I mean, it might be implicit in validation test suite there, but just that's that's really good. Um, I will add another little yellow sticky for that. Uh, but thanks, Nick. Yeah, that makes sense. So nothing, nothing more to add on that. Uh, again, comments um, and feedback, welcome. And we'll move on to the kind of final, bigger, hopefully the bigger topics for today. But it's a small, small group, so um, let's see where we get to. But that's the. Um, starting to plan out this year and the work of, of this group for, for the coming year. Um, and which areas or any areas or topics that we, we should be focusing so we can get them into the calendar. And um, so far, apart from the data quality work, it's been, you know, the agenda's just been whatever's in the front of my mind at the moment. And uh, obviously we, we want that to be uh, ensure that the community gets uh, a chance to discuss the things that are of relevance and importance to them. So um, my idea would be from in discussion now and then in, in the other forums to service a long list of topics that we could focus on, uh, which would then review and prioritize. And it, it may be a case that we take that long list and any recommendations to the steering committee and to uh, the other the option, adoption engagement forum for their views and comments and um, we'll prioritize them and then schedule them in for, for a discussion throughout 2023 uh, so we can kind of make progress on the areas that are relevant so I'll pause there um, and again if anyone wants to call out now we have a number of outstanding issues in the GitHub repositories which is traditionally been the place to kind of log log these topics uh, but I thought I'd start with a just more general conversational call for areas of interest and I'll pause I'm happy to, to start with one if no one else wants to jump in, but the um, aligned with Sport England's Uniting the Movement strategy, um, the focus on reaching those typically underrepresented groups, um, you know, that's that's something we want to focus on. So the, and one of those is the, for disabled people and people um, with disabilities, getting them access to and the opportunities for sport and physical activity. So some of the work that's done previously was around some additions or additional elements to the opportunity model to, um, to describe adaptations or facilities in place, features, amenities. Um, so if we can describe those things, I'm talking about um, ramps for wheelchair access, um, pool hoists, and all those kind of facilities. Um, if we can describe those in a consistent way, that's something we can add to the feeds over time to, to improve that, um, to make it easier for everyone to know if an activity is gonna be right for them. So 
that's the first kind of thing that comes to mind, progressing the work done on the accessibility. So in the last AEF, there sounds like there's some interest from groups that were not previously part of the accessibility work uh, to be part of that. So that's sounds like a good idea. And I, I missed that one, Tim. You'll have to be my uh, contact in, in, in kind of issue when we get those um, people invited along or, you know, create the right workshop kind of forum to, to, to progress those ideas. Yeah, so that was um, Jess from the Activity Alliance who came along to that. So, um, yeah, we got uh, good good contact with her there. So, yeah, we can invite her along when, when you've got a date date booked in. Was it also Jess that had the those kind of images and logos for uh, to describe features and things? So. Yeah, that was it, yeah. So that's a set of um, kind of standard images that or badges that can be used to, to describe at a glance the uh, facilities at the um, location. So where there's a, a standard way of listing those alongside um, our existing amenity features, something to explore. Beyond accessibility, the, um, the the activity list and the facilities list. Um, keen to, to see that they are um, fully exploited as kind of key reference data for the sector. So that's something we can we, we hope to to progress in the near term. And that follows on. We had a brief chat about that about how those other Sport England funded bodies are, are using lists of activities, but they don't always align. So there's, there's a piece there. It might also be worth uh, pulling out kind of those uh, GitHub issues where there's been kind of recent conversation. So I think that, that might be quite a good way of determining where there might be. Um, interest in in you know particular things um so i know one comes to mind that we spoke about before around the um the what's it called uh high high frequency stuff it's kind of an ongoing conversation but um but there's probably others that are are in there that have got recent comments yeah that um high frequency sessions ad hoc sessions that's still a um unresolved you know and it, how it kind of the, the shape of the data is changing um so yeah that's definitely one uh, all right Stephen, we're, we're just kind of um airing potential um topics or areas for this group to focus on over over the coming year so we can create a long list um uh, prioritize them take them to the open active steering committee kind of get other views and then schedule them in throughout the year so we can make the most of um the time we've got whether people give up to this group uh conscious that beyond the um the date quality work it's been a little bit ad hoc in the in the since i took over in, in, in last summer so uh not to put you on the spot but if there's anything uh any anything on your mind uh feel do do share it now yeah, I'll let you know. Thank you. Yes, yeah, and again, apologies for joining late to the call at uh, previous calls I've run. So, uh, no yeah, but I'll give it some consideration. You've only missed some um, some some of the kind of data quality reporting at a, an individual individual feed level. So, um, so I'll share share those around shortly. It's quite a small group, so this could be a short meeting if there's not a lot, uh, if there's no, no other topics coming in. Tim, is there anything else you can think of that from, from the work we've done? Um, 
Uh, no, only other thing possibly, um, but we'd maybe have to do some work to gauge the demand for it, but it's to revisit the roots um, specification. Oh, yeah. A couple of other, um, that's come up a couple of times in conversations. So, Thank you, um, Tim. Yeah, uh, good one. So roots, um, both British Cycling and um, the British Canoe Union have, have expressed some interest in roots, which was, and roots, as it's described, has been cycling, running, and horse riding, I think, were the uh, walking as well. So those were the kind of key things. But canoeing, um, it seems like there's quite a good fit uh, for that. So that's an opportunity to, ex to extend that. Uh, and this is a chance to... Roots gives us a... It's a, a new angle, I suppose, to the open active feeds in that it's an opportunity for self-directed exercise rather than... Um, coached or you know um, necessarily at a facility or, or a gym so it's a different a different side of it but certainly something to explore um another potential area is the relationship with open active and open referral and the um kind of growing movement around social prescribing Um, yeah, with regards to the um, with the regards to the first of those, um, which has completely set my mind to think about. It. What was the first one you mentioned there before open referral? Roots. roots. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Goodness. Um, roots. Uh, it might be helpful before any next discussion on that, just from where it kind of got to before. If there are publishers who are interested in publishing their data, getting that data out of them in any form. Um, I mean, when we, so Roots is obviously a little bit less mature than a lot of the other specifications, but when we started out with data for um, the other types of physical activity, it was, it was looking at the data that currently existed in spreadsheet, CSV, whatever you can get hold of, right? To, to get a sense of what it actually is. Um, one of the issues with Roots is that the specification has kind of evolved off the back of kind of a lot of people saying, oh, it'd be nice to have this, nice to have that, et cetera. Um, but then the data not necessarily being available to then, you know, look at and see how it fits in or what, what that looks like. So great if they've got people like kayaking saying, you know, we'd love to do something with roots. Um, I guess my first, my first, my suggested first question to them would be, what have you currently got? And can we have like, are you happy to share that openly? You know, whack it as an attachment to an email to this this group uh, as a big CSV file, so we can all look at it and say, yeah, okay, that makes sense or whatever. Um, and the same with anyone else who's interested, um, because it, it, if we have hypothetical conversations about this without data actually existing, that can be uh, challenging. Um, and if it's the case that we're looking at data capture, then my suggestion would be, what initiatives are there that are actually starting? That you know are an, an opportunity to capture the data because we've also had lots of kind of hypotheticals before where it's like oh yeah we'd love to capture this and it kind of it doesn't go anywhere because there's no projects on the horizon that are going to build anything to capture that uh for kayaking or for whoever it is um which is um uh yeah so if there's a need i suppose hopefully someone is already doing it closed yeah. rather than open so it's just kind of tapping into that no, I fully. I think yeah, two things there. So the, the there is work ongoing. That, you know, data does exist, and this isn't hypothetical. But in in terms of canoeing, so that's that's a good thing. Uh, but I think as a more general point, you know, given time pressures, that everyone's under, and, and which is why I was keen to move from the um, the kind of general data quality stuff to the feed level stuff. But I'd like to keep this focused on you know, not on hypothetical things. Uh, where possible. And I think that's the case with open active and open referral as well, that there are enough um, initiatives where people are trying to to embed that kind of social prescribing capability um, that it's it's beyond just the hypothetical now. 
Um, so is there, are there any, beyond the high frequency sessions, is there anything else from the recent GitHub conversations, Nick, that stands out? I was looking at something else. Give me a second to check that. Um, and I've got a point on the previous uh, stuff that we were speaking about uh, after that. Um, Um, well, there's some there's some things in here about places feed, um, which we had conversations about uh, previously, but uh, I am um, and we got to somewhere with it, but it wasn't really in a place where it was it was particularly formalized. Um, so it might be good to revisit the places feeds again. I know they're being published by a few organizations um, just to kind of, yeah, check that that still will make sense. So this is, um, is that a link to active places or are we just saying literally from the, the existing feeds distilling just the locations to display geographically or is this a kind of find a gym capability or what, what's the? Yeah, sure. So the use case is um, you're finding exactly, you're finding the place itself rather than the things that are going on in the place. Um, and this is something that, for example, MCR Active are using. Um, and I think uh, Playways also use um, to help organ people to find organizations with certain types of facilities, like find all my local swimming pools, that kind of thing, rather than find me a particular type of class. So historically, the Open Active data has been much more focused on the sessions um, and the places data exists within those. Um, but there's also become uh it's become obvious that there's a need for within the ecosystem to represent just the places to hang other things off and that's where the yeah. places feed comes in so not not on its own necessarily uh from a static system because static data is isn't not that useful and also to mention that there is a kind of connection to active places that has been i think it's in uh it's, it's documented somewhere. Um, there's a way of linking data to active places, but there's never been any, um, let's, uh, let's call it like a uh, impetus, real world impetus to, uh, to actually do that. So although a lot of people are like, oh, we should link all the stuff together um, when you're like, okay, great. So which booking system is going to put active places reference data inside it? Everyone's like, uh, mm. so UK based, Active Places is a, is, a, is a UK only data set. So my my international booking system is gonna to have to have this drop down only for UK reference data. How does that work? Can we not use something else? Or, and, or I already use Google Places. Can we not use a Google Places ID instead of an Active Places ID? Why are we coming up with our, another set of IDs um, if it's a, an international use case? Um, so it, it's back to that. There's, no one yet has said, yeah, we really wanna implement Active Places reference data in our booking system to, uh, to, to to link everything together. I think the, yeah, no, I, I, I get that. Um, so there might be a, a role to provide that kind of reference linking, you know, those identifiers, a data set that matches them up as a, as a kind of resource for people that do want to do that, you know, whether that links to a Google place or, um, yeah. yeah, actually, off the top of my head, I mean, if given Sport England funds active places, if they had, if you did it the other way around, which might make more sense, active places can link to data and data feeds. If all places have a place ID, um, which is part of the kind of places feed conversation, then you can link the ID from active places to the open data set. Um, and, uh, oh, absolutely brilliant. Debbie's answered it uh which is they're already doing it so maybe sorry i speak too soon maybe maybe booking systems are happy to do it um debbie how do you do that right now are you doing that through gladstone or yourself 
Um, we're just doing it through ourselves. I think we raised it through Gladstone as a development piece to add the field to the interface for going forward. Um, but we're just storing it in our own database at the moment so that we can associate their site ID to our site ID. And so do you do you have a kind of drop down or is it manually entered? It's just put into the database at the moment. We've not got an interface to do it. And is the request to Gladstone to have a drop down of all active places to choose from or just to kind of copy and paste the identifier? Um, it was just a field for us to put that number in. Um, I don't know how they would pull those IDs from active places. I'm not sure. Um, there's just, I know we're talking to active places. We've also had a challenge of like uh, where one site closes and another one opens and that sort of stuff. So if you were to pull that information from active places, it potentially could be wrong, maybe. It's just, it's just that danger. Uh, that's really useful. I'm learning a lot. So um, are we, we will follow up with active places. We, we haven't had a chat yet uh, beyond very basic. Um, I know what they're doing at the moment is extremely manual, isn't it? Their job, they, I think they ring around to find if there's any changes in um, a particular location, whether they've introduced new facilities um, or and, and obtaining like information like the size of the pool and all of that sort of stuff, which feels like an awful job to do. <laughs> I feel sorry for those people because <laughs> it's not just leisure that they're doing it for, but they're doing it for a lot of other a lot of other areas as well. But um, yeah, we had a meeting about with them about a few things and decided that we would store that ID so that we could associate the two um, in hope that going forward that meant that we would be able to possibly communicate with them if a change was made or something like that. And it just maintaining that connection a bit easier. That's great. That's that's really highlights the use case there, doesn't it? Um, and it, it might be really good to have a conversation with a few other systems as well to see if anyone else is picking this up. And um, I still wonder whether Active Place is doing the work and linking into open active data might be the easier way around for everyone, because obviously otherwise there's a lot of booking systems individually that need to put the field in that Debbie's talking about rather than just Active Place is doing it once. Um, and but, as uh, an operator, we're getting pretty fed up of having to maintain things in so many different places, if I'm honest. <laughs> like it, it's just, it becomes a massive overhead to be able to, we do everything in Gladstone, but then we have to go into the interface for open active because not everything's pulled from Gladstone. And then we need to communicate with active places. And then we also need to communicate with four global um, and they're not pulling from active places for everything yet. And there's just so many things now, there's so many pools from data. Um, we just need to stop having to put it in so many different places. We need to synchronize. That That is exactly, I think, the kind of challenge, reducing this data fragmentation, silos, repeated effort, that is you know, part of the aim of this phase. So if we can make any steps forward, on that one. So for global, are they reporting at a uh, at a location level? Is is that is that what I'm yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. They do, yeah. Really interesting. I think to me, like um, there's there's just I'm just trying to work out how to how to describe it. But to me, it feels like we have all these places in the opportunity data, uh, and we just want a, a kind of convenient way of accessing just those as a kind of as a kind of reference list a bit like we've done with the activity list um it just you know if we can use that once or create it once manage it once and, and use it many times that helps um but obviously this is something that one operator is involved in and one operator is working towards but that's not not everybody so we've got to kind of See where everybody else at is is on that is at on that journey. Um, it, so it, it could be it, sorry, Howard, I was, was going to say it could be it could be good to host a call with um, you know uh, the a lot of other other operators that might be interested in simplifying the challenge that Debbie's outlined there uh, to kind of see if if there's lots of ways of solving that problem. Um, certainly, the open active data that is entered could be used by active places. But I know Active Places is far more information than um, just yeah. what Open Active captures. So um, there's definitely some syncing there. But the number of fields 
total synced between the two is probably quite small compared to, as uh, Debbie outlined, the kind of enormity of uh, of open active, of sorry, of um, active places because it's like how how wide is your swimming pool in inches or something, you know, or, or centimeters. But there's, you know, there may be scope. We we may be able to simplify their lives if we can provide them a list of of changing locations drawn from you know changes in the feeds. That might that might be something they can. They can use to target their kind of um, maintenance activity. There might be ways to, you know, win-win. Um, so just right now, I've got kind of the accessibility components of the um, of the specification or the the opportunity spec, location spec. Uh, describing immediately features. I mean by that, I think. Activity lists, which again, some of those features already appear in the active places. So to me, there is a lot of overlap. So accessibility, the activity list and the facility list, high frequency sessions, the overlap with open active and open referral or the interface, routes, places. That's my quick summary of the things we've touched on so far. Anything else? Just on the, the access, accessibility one, I think you mentioned at the beginning, but just wanted to clarify a lot. And as it stands in the Gladstone interface that we've got, we can't associate um, a type of accessible equipment, let's say, to a place such as a hoist. I think you mentioned hoist and stuff at the beginning. So that's the intention, is it, that we could do such? Um, well, the, the the intention is we explore what's what's possible, you know, and, uh, yeah. and and desirable. We know that we we possibly don't do enough to make it, um, you know. From from we've had various ODI events where we've we've talked um, to disabled sports people, and the 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 message was that we don't do enough to explain what facilities are available, whether that activity is going to be right for, for a particular need, set of needs. So um, so we want to explore that and see what's, what we can do. Yeah, we had um, a call with um, Parasport and I'm just trying to remember who else was on it from I'm in. Um, there's two. Um, trying to help with Parasport setting up an um, activity finder. And those sorts of things came up in the, at the moment you can only assign um, what's it called um, just, uh, like something like um, event is wheelchair accessible mm. to the event rather than to the facility itself. Right. Um, I'm, I'm in the back of my mind, digging through the uh, the spec, and I'm thinking we have location immediately features in, in some of the, I've seen documented somewhere. Um, yeah, it's probably worth saying that, and, and Stephen may know this, that the capability does exist in the spec to, to include call hoists. I think that, in fact, is what GLL use um, to use surface that information through um, open play. Uh, but um, but it's not standardized, so they have to type in pool hoist, pool hoist rather than a pick list. Ticking, a pick list correct. And, and yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's correct, Nick. So, um, okay. So, so, if if somebody wanted to visit a center and not necessarily to do an activity, um, they need to know how accessible the facility is, as well as the activity that they're they may be interested in yeah and, and uh, to my mind it keeps there's another link there to active places you know this may be information that they've already captured and collected so that mm -hmm. um so it, it's definitely something something to explore um but at the same time i don't know if the if it's right to rely on active places rather than the operator or should it be the other way around just because if active places are ringing round and that's their way of doing it, that's a very delayed approach. Yeah. Um, they might not find out for 12 months that something's changed at that facility. True, true. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so there's a timeliness. I, I'm, I think I was trying to hone in on this idea of storing it somewhere once uh, that everyone and then using it several times. But um, timeliness is is obviously relevant. Um, well, as a hand, it might be that when we have the active places conversation, if active places is interested in integrating with open active, i.e. pulling places data from open active, they're obviously going to get more live data. So it might be that it, and uh, if let's say they've got 120 fields, um, if they're ringing around everyone and 25 of those fields are synchronized with open active automatically, you know, Debbie doesn't need to update them on stuff that's changed that open active is already sharing with the world. They'll, they'll only need to go through and do the ones that Open Active doesn't currently share. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chris, you've been quiet. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to find the uh, mute button. Um, no, I mean, you've covered pretty much everything. I'm just going through my head and everything. I'm just. Uh, yeah, for active places at the moment, and just uh, downloading some data um, from that as well to uh, have a quick look. But um, I suppose I mean the one I'd be interested mainly is um, when we get around to say the the issues potentially from from GitHub because one of the right. things I want to look at is are the issues are they getting resolved? Are they staying open for too long? Are they closing when they should be? Are we looking at potential you know SLAs or anything like that? And trying to put some sort of process or procedure in place just to make sure sure that there's a track of okay we've had x amount of issues raised this month are they getting resolved you know month on month or are they staying stagnant and not actually getting resolved and making sure the right people are being aware of them so um i think that'd be a good one to pick up soon okay i wondered if there's anything from your from your conversations with with the various groups but if, if you think we've covered everything so far that's fine um At the, I guess one one thing that I have I, when I showed that um, the kind of timeline and talked about oops talked about this this crawler that goes to the catalog and then catalog catalogs to the catalog each individual catalog and then to each individual data set site and brings back the endpoints. Um, I I want interested in the the process that gets things added to that original catalog or the catalogs to make sure that. Um, all the open active feeds um, that are out there are, are represented, you know, so that's something I'm keen to um, to explore. I have a feeling at the minute that some are not making it onto that catalog list, so they're, kind of, they're going to be missed out by this. They're not going to appear in the status page. They're not going to um, be, be visible to, to, the, to wider users. Um, so that's something I wanted to explore. Yeah, good to do that as part of the status page work, perhaps to make sure it's up to date and uh, whatever. The, and the process is already, I think, documented, but make sure that's clear. Um, uh, I was going to say also back on this slide, uh, I wasn't sure which slide to attack because you jumped back for a second. I said, oh, I can get into the last slide. Uh, this slide, uh, courses is another one. Uh, we've done, I mean, courses data has been opened up by several organizations now. Um, and um, I know that CAP2 have done some work around that um, uh, to open up their, their courses data. Um, and so they, I think there was some feedback from that implementation as well. So it might be a good, a good time to kind of gather our thoughts on courses um, and have a think about, you know, make sure everyone's happy with the way it's, it's shaken out um, across the different implementations um, and, uh, and then formalize that somewhere, basically. Excuse me a second, I'm just going to... Um... So while you're doing that, Nick can ask you a really stupid question. Um, when, when you mean courses, do we mean like a golf course or a course that someone can sign up for? Always. No, Sorry, no. Good, no, good question. No, 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 it's, a, it's great, great to clarify. It's very leisure specific kind of terminology. So it's all very like, yeah, uh, courses is in, um, uh, like a swimming session, uh, if, you, if you can, you can sign up to a, a five-week uh, uh, 
whatever tennis course to learn to play tennis, beginner tennis in Islington Tennis Center, which is a GLL site uh, where you can learn to, to do that, where you can sign up to swimming lessons in, um, uh, in a, a kind of swimming pool where you get like a, it's a, a year lot. Well, I think it's every month rolling and you pay yeah. monthly and then you get access to that. Um, I was about to try and name a lever and active site, but it slipped my mind. So apologies, I couldn't name drop a lever and active site off the top of my head. The sort of difference you've got between a course and a class is that a course you enroll on to basically the whole course, all weeks, whereas a class, it's scheduled event, but you're booking into each session individually. There's no regularity. That's the, that's that, that is the basic makeup of the difference between a class being it's scheduled, but you book in on demand. Whereas a course, you book onto a session and that enrolls you into the duration of the rest of that course. If we, I think we'd already discussed something with courses and God's sake, and tell me if I'm wrong, Andy, I'm sure we did. And I think it was on the roadmap at some point, but just when it comes to do it, looking at courses, things to consider such as um, how the operator would prefer to pre present the cost of that course for example so they may want to present it in a way that a weekly price or they may want to present a total price for all the sessions that are outstanding or they may want to present a direct debit price which has absolutely no association to the weekly price um, so it's the variations of that and how the operator would define what they want to display that's all packaged up isn't it debbie you know the different options how you can actually roll on to it and what potential options you can pay yeah it's just displaying it like for example for our swimming lessons we wouldn't want you to just take the prices from the product in the course with an mrm and display that because that's not the price that we would ask the customer pay by direct debit um so it's just considering how how that where that data comes from and how it needs to look and what the variations might be what controls we want you to put in place yep yeah that's a, that's a whole discussion but i think yeah. we need to have at some stage or other because it's got to be held somewhere for it to be included within the the open data feed to present the consumer about data feeds and how they present all the options mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, well, we, we're approaching time. Um, anyone else? Would anyone anything else? Okay. Well, I'll write. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> one, one more. Oh. The previous slide. I didn't get to the that that point. Uh, the previous slide. I realized that we might have missed uh, in the little post-it things, uh, the activity list editor. Um, there's a, uh, a kind of a bit of a gap at the moment because the controlled vocabulary is stored in lots of different places. And maybe they should all just be in the one editor. I don't know, but um, that bit, uh, some inconsistency there be worth concluding. Thank you very much. Uh, we're kind of uh, vocabulary editor and a reference implementation are the two main things. Yeah, and it, also for completeness, I'm just I was just looking at the bid and checking that we've got all the words because <laughs> that's the last time we enumerated the list. Uh, and uh, the libraries are also in there, so the libraries being the PHP, the Ruby, and the .NET libraries. Um, so if there's any changes to the, depending on what the change is, if it changes the models, it will change the libraries, if it changes the validator, it will change it, et cetera. So there's, there's interconnection there. But yeah. Um, that, we, I that, think... That's a really good one. Um, so in terms of libraries, uh, for those that are implemented on, on the call, um, do we still need all those different variety of languages, Ruby, PHP? Because um, it was kind of hope to simplify the code base um, and move in, in the direction of Node and JavaScript. Uh, has anyone on the call got any thoughts on that? Is anyone I, say if, I was going to say, if, in case those on the call weren't uh, aware, the PHP library is being used by GLL and uh, Flow uh, actively. 
and the .NET library is being used actively by Firestone. And yeah, I was going to confirm that as well, Nick. Thank you. It's spot on. Right, I'll make a note of that. I can't ignore them too. Then um, it's also worth saying that the Ruby library is being used by Good Jim uh, and uh, one of the Booking Pilot implementers. Um, I can't remember which one. One of the four, uh, and uh, and also by Bookwen. Doesn't Morse use uh, Ruby as well? Yeah, that's true. Oh yes, of course, yeah. of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so Fair therefore, GLL, GLL use yeah. uh, use that library. So what what was that? You, what did you say, Stephen? Uh, one of one of our web partners, um, okay, who actually provides a places feed uses Ruby. Okay, well that's that then. <laughs> I was hoping we could simplify the code base, but uh, that may not be. As easy as easy said than done. Um, brilliant. So the only thing I think is just Stephen, and uh, I'll, I'll revisit for Andy as well. So this is the um, snapshot for a single feed uh, based on some of the data quality metrics that we looked at before. And I think this is a Gladstone one. Um, and I wanted to get through and do one for everybody. Uh, you know, just at least one because it's not automated yet. But this shows the kind of um, the figures we were looking at and the kind of metrics we were looking at in the data quality for an individual data set site, an individual data feed rather. And here's another one. Um, I think this was a legend one, uh, although I'm not sure. Um, so just to bring that those figures kind of to life. Um, so I'm keen to, and Chris will maybe be in touch uh, be good to know who's who could we share these with you know at each organization and have a conversation with um, so that's just I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on that now Andy is that the kind of thing you you'd want to, to look at or have we lost him no, no sorry uh, well, how would I certainly been sorry sorry uh, carry on Sorry, yeah, I was struggling with the, the new one. Yeah, yeah, um, interesting to see those stats and figures. And yeah, I know that that is a Gladstone customer. But yeah, having uh, details through that will help us um, uh, from our perspective across the business. Well, we, I can share them with you, you know, in the first instance. And you might, if there's anyone else in the organization, you can pass them on, but I'll, I'll, I'll share them with you. Uh, is it Stephen, being done at a facility level or an operator level? Um, these are taking each kind of API endpoint at this stage. So if we looked at, um, I think it was that one, this is the data set site. So for these, are, each one of these is a feed of mm -hmm. session, um, series and sessions and facility uses. Uh, so these are based at that level at the moment. So these could be aggregated up to, um, kind of, I suppose, a Gladstone level or um, I'm wondering where I'd get the operator from there, but uh, I'm, sure, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure I could find it. Well, the operator is, uh, uh, is Ledger SK. It's made up yeah. of multiple sites within it. So then that would be in the facilities. So I think yeah, this is so the operator level. Okay, so the this is the operator level. level. Just wondering. Uh, broken down so for that operator there are you know I don't you would get three or four kind of uh, or possibly two out of this one one for the series and one for the, the facility use and individual slots um, as an operator would be interested in the same thing but a places level yeah yeah sorry if you were to go back to where you were sorry Tim. Yeah, if you want to go, you went. So that's obviously looking at the operator level, but what a lot of guys are looking at here, Stephen and Debbie are looking at, is that we look at the makeup of each each place or centre, right? Each each facility, if you like. Yeah. Okay. So it's that, terminology, um, isn't it? Facilities is a is a yeah. activity in the feed world. Sorry, uh, places. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that's interesting. And once it's automated. 
I can put in those kind of, you know, I can, I can split it out any which way, but it's not, we're not quite there yet. So, um, so Chris, I'll follow. Up I need to jump off for another call. So, apologies. okay, yeah. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Bye. Um, so, I'll follow up uh, with Chris and I'll follow up with, uh, with individuals there, and um, I'll make a note of that so that yeah. a place. Split would be useful as well. Okay. It might, it might not be. It might be obvious to you, uh, Howard, there, but uh, Andy represents Gladstone, which is the booking system, but yep. he won't have any control over the data itself. Course, the data that's being entered in is, yeah, is Debbie's as the operator. Yeah. Oh, you the, think so, do you? You think so? <laughs> well, I don't, I, I don't know. I, Andy's got fingers in pie, let's, so who knows? <laughs> let, 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 let's hold that one quite open then, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, so we'll call it there. Thank you very much for your time. And um, Howard, sorry, I was just going to say I, I would be interested in seeing the same results for GL um, on the on the flow open data feed. So um, similar to what Debbie's requested, because um, yeah, as, as Nick pointed out, we, we we put the information into the data entry is down to us. Uh, flow just display it. So um, I would be interested in seeing that. Okay, we shall focus on those and get those out. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for your time. And uh, I will write up this list of, share this list of uh, topics that we've come in. We'll try and prioritize them and start planning ahead for, for the coming sessions. Cheers, everyone. Bye now. No problem. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, all. Bye now.